The 4th of July is a time to spend with family and friends, eating and drinking and watching fireworks. But what about the 4th of July being a time for family to die together? That's precisely what happened to the Coons family in Wisconsin in 1987. This is their story. Well, hello everybody, I'm Sean and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel if you are returning. Here I mainly research true crime and share them with you. Uh, if you enjoy my content, please subscribe. It really makes me know that I'm doing well the more people that I have watching my stuff. Unfortunately, there's a lot of views that come from non-subs, and I'd like to turn that around. Um, I have a chart. You know, that being said, I broke, a, broke 500 subscribers. Thank you. It's taken a long time, about a year and a half that I've been doing this. Um, getting closer to that thousand view or the thousand subscribers then maybe i can start doing this as a career because i really enjoy entertaining people and exploring this world that i don't really understand because i don't know why people would want to hurt others or kill others and things like that so like and share that that's appreciated to to. Um, I do respond to all comments where I'm trying to. I mean, if I, if I get a couple thousand comments, I don't know if I'll be able to respond to them all, but I'll try. And I usually will take suggestions because I've had a lot of people suggest certain things on how I present the videos and things like that. So I do listen. And if you have any idea of a true crime you'd like me to do, please put in the suggestions. Or in, in the comments, because then I will look into it. Now, that being said, on with today's story. I'm going to pronounce this family's name as Coons. K-U-N-Z. This is the most common pronunciation that I have heard. I've heard it pronounced other ways, but I'm sticking with the most common. It just makes it, I don't know, I guess easier. The Coons family lived on a 108-acre farm outside of Athens, Wisconsin. Athens was a population of about 1,100 people, and it was west of Wausau. And this is back in the 80s. I, I don't know if they've had a population growth or decline since then. It is a small, sleepy farm town where most people know each other. Well, aside from the Coons, uh, they kept to themselves and usually only come came into town when they needed something. I've looked extensively, extensively, I mean, like hours and hours and hours looking for any photos that I could find of the family. I never found any. I found photos that people would say, hey, this is, this is the family, here's the family members, blah, blah, blah. But it'd just be one person doing it. I could never find anything that would collaborate with them. So rather than show false pictures of people, I'm just not going to show anything. Uh, the other photos that I will use through this, I found from multiple sources. So I'm taking them as true. I'm not sure if they are or not, but I am using them as the truth. So on the morning of the 5th of July, Kenny Coons came home after sleeping in his car from the night before. He was out watching fireworks and he got tired and didn't want to drive home. So he just slept in his car. He entered the main house to find a bloodbath. His Aunt Marie, who was 72, was found in the entryway. His brother, Randy, who was 30, was found on the kitchen floor. His uncle, Clarence, 
who was 76, was found in his bedroom. And his other aunt, Irene, she was 81, found sitting in an armchair. Each of them had a bullet wound in their head from a 22 caliber. Missing from the scene was Kenny and Randy's mother, Helen. She was 70. There was no sign of her. The police were called and initially thought Kenny might have been the killer. But that was he was quickly cleared from this. So, like I was saying, the Coons didn't have many visitors, and the police were just amazed by what they found when they came to search the house. The main house was a trash pit. It was filthy. It was unkept. They were hoarders. There was piles of newspapers and magazines and everything. A couple sources even said that they found bags of feces just laying around the house, which makes sense because they did not have indoor plumbing and they had no running water, no toilets. They had to use an outhouse. So I don't know if they just got lazy and started crapping in bags. But there was a couple sources talking about that. So it's, it's kind of gross. And there was no central heating. And the only heating was from a wood burner in the kitchen. Since the majority of the coons were elderly, it's believed that they collected their Social Security and never spent it. And it's said in a police report that there was upwards of $20,000 just laying strewn around the house. Like in, the, in this uh, kitchen cabinet, there's a pile of cash. On the table, there's a pile of cash. In this drawer, there was a pile of cash. Under the bed, there was a pile of cash. It was just laying around for anyone to take. The other thing that the officers found an abundance of was adult paraphernalia, magazines, movies. It appeared that Clarence had a subscription to some of the top magazines. Uh, it was also discovered that Randy and his mom, Helen, slept in the same bed. I don't know if anything happened with them, but... They were sleeping in the same bed, at least. Kenny lived in a camper on another part of the property. I mean, it's 108 acres, so I mean, it's a pretty big property. And uh, so he stayed off on his in his own camper. Kenny was the only person that actually had a job. So he had that going for him. He was of a lower intelligence, though, so... Um, And that could be because of uh, possible incest. But I'll get on with that a little bit later. Randy used to drive Helen into town to get supplies. And one of the townspeople recalled that one day she came into the store to buy, I believe, a toaster. Um, and she also purchased a couple boxes of twenty two caliber bullets. She stated that Randy was going to shoot some blackbirds on their property because they were annoying, I guess. I don't know. Then Helen started to complain about the others in the house, watching smutty movies all the time, and that she couldn't stand their perversions. Just dirty movies, dirty magazines everywhere. And she just carried on about the subject. She was ticked by it, obviously. So the police started to wonder, maybe Helen had something to do with the killings. You know, she was missing. And they quickly changed their minds after that and thought she possibly was more of a kidnapper because she didn't drive. Um, all the guns seemed to have been found in the house. So they cleared her um, and just assumed that she was a kidnapped victim. 
The townspeople, though, never suspected her. They actually were wearing buttons that said, where's Helen? Um, they were rallying to find Helen. While investigating the family to try to figure out who killed them and where Helen was, it was discovered that Kenny might have been the product of incest. In 1933, Helen became pregnant after a neighbor, Frank Gums, was convicted of assaulting her sexually. So, he is the person that they assume is Kenny's birth father, but there were also rumors circulating that Clarence not only was his uncle, but was also his father. And Kenny even told investigators that he saw his mom and uncle in bed many different times when he was younger. So, yeah, I, I don't know what to think about that, but okay. At first, it seemed that no one had ever gone out to the house, and the police just kept coming up empty, but somebody did hit the front of the suspect list. Chris Jacobs III became a prime subject. Or suspect. I think suspect sounds better. Prime suspect. He often went out there to purchase cars from the family. Used cars. I mean, they didn't really have money, but they had a ton of cars, and it was like a junkyard with cars. On January 29th, 1988, a search warrant was used to search Jacob's home and car, and they located two 22 caliber rifles. There was nothing else said that what happened after that. And the next note that I ever found was on March 20th of 2000, or sorry, 1988, Helen was located. They found her. She was partially submerged in a swamp 19 miles from their home. She had been shot with the same weapon as her son and her siblings. Prosecutors then felt that they had enough evidence to charge Jacob, so they did on August 31st, five counts of first degree homicide. It was said that he went there to buy a car from Randy and got into a fight with him about negotiations or whatever. And then he just decided to kill them all and take Helen with him uh, as a hostage. Another source said that um, he took Helen with plans to uh, assault her to prove that he was a man to his father. I couldn't find anything else that, you know, collab collaborated with this. Um, a little over a year later, on October 28, 1989, Jacobs was acquitted. The jury deliberated only for a few hours, and the main evidence that prosecution was using to uh, use against Jacobs was a track, uh, or a set of tire tracks in the mud that matched Jacobs' truck. Well, Unfortunately, it matched a lot of other vehicles, too. So, he was acquitted. Some speculate that the Coons' family, that the history of the Coons' family, impacted the jury, and that's what led to them letting him go. It was quick. It went quiet for a few years. And then, Stacy Weiss came forward with some information claiming that Jacobs did kill the family. She was an ex-girlfriend of Jacobs and stated that he admitted to her that he murdered the people. She admitted this, or she said that he admitted this in 1991. He told her that he had to prove that he was a man. So here's the second time that he was proving to be a man to do this horrendous act. Jacob's lawyer said that she was just a jilted lover and was trying to get revenge on him. She was also up on charges and was trying to get them reduced with her confession. 
But, as any of us know, Jacobs could not be tried twice for the same crime. And because he was already found innocent the first time. And this is double jeopardy. So, what can the prosecutors do? They decided to charge him with kidnapping of Helen. And they rushed to get this uh, charge out there. The main reason is because they did so hours prior to the state of limitations or statute of limitations running out. This was July 7th, 1993. And I mean, it was just mere hours before they couldn't charge him with anything. He fought the charges and even took it to the U.S. Supreme Court, stating that the new charges violated his constitutional rights and claimed double jeopardy. Now, this was 93 when this all started. By 1996 is when the court or the Supreme Court refused to hear his appeal. So, I mean, another three years, almost exactly three years later. But in the long run, Jacobs was found guilty of kidnapping. And this was in 1998 that he was finally uh, found guilty. Judge Donald Fox sentenced him to 31 years, which is the maximum punishment possible for kidnapping. The jury took only 10 hours to deliberate. On February 4th, 2020, Jacobs was released from prison on extended uh, supervision, so basically on parole. He refused to see his parole officer and was sent to pr prison to finish out his sentence. He didn't want to go back to Marathon County in Wisconsin. Uh, he was scared about retaliation from the police because he, he did say that the police coerced his confessions and, you know, kind of fubbed the evidence and things like that. So he thought that the police would be out to get him. So he made sure that he would go back to prison and finish out his sentence of the 31 years, which ends sometime in 2029 but then he'll be free and not have to worry about going to probation and not have to worry about going back to wisconsin at all so justice i don't know even though jacobs is in prison for the kidnapping of helen there's still a bunch of gossip about the murders that people were not convinced it, that he did it a woman stated that on the night of the murders, she saw a car parked near the property, to, near the Coons property. And they had like a spotlight and they were shining it into the property back and forth. As she neared the vehicle, they shined it right into her eyes. So then she couldn't see who it was or what the vehicle looked like or anything like that. So she couldn't identify them at all. And... It just basically dropped at that. She just found it really odd. and does sound pretty odd. Um, there's also a theory that Randy was dealing drugs. And that's why there was so much money laying her about the house. It said that, you know, it was a drug deal gone wrong. And the person that was purchasing the drugs or selling the drugs killed off the family. And supposedly, and I couldn't find anything about it. I found like two articles talking about it, but I couldn't find anything else about this new crime. Supposedly there was another farmhouse murder about 20 years later that happened less than 10 miles from the Coons house. And this is unsolved. And a lot of people were wondering, are the two linked? Like I said, I could not find anything else about it besides the two lines that I read in the couple articles. Of course, this is not the only violence that the Coons family has had in their lifetime. In 1905, the parents of Helen, Irene, Clarence, and Marie had some tra had some tragedy had had some tragedy tragedy. 
Yes. Anna and Ignatz. Ignatz. I G N A T Z. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I hope I am. Ignatz. Where the parents of the siblings and Randy and Kenny's grandparents. They were living in Ignatz's mother's house, Mary. This was in Mantowic, Wisconsin. Uh, one evening, Anna came home and discovered that Mary had been bludgeoned to death and was laying in bed. Ignatz's brother, Wenzel, was the perpetrator, and he was sent to a mental hospital to spend the rest of his life. Apparently, one of Ignatz's brothers was already a patient there. So two of Ignatz's brothers are now patients for life in a mental institution. Um, so they had some problems there. It's, it, and kids, just in case you don't know, mental, uh, mental institution were common places for people that they thought were insane. Uh, a lot of states had them. They've done away with them because there's a lot of abuse and things like that that's going on there. So. Um, otherwise that's it for this. I mean, it was such a strange case, strange case and an interesting family. I did not find anything else about Kenny except that he died in 2001. And the only reason I even know that he died in 2001 is it's on his tombstone. I found the tombstone with the family on it. Um, so yeah, that. That's sad. I hope Kenny lived a pretty good life otherwise. I mean, he was born in 33, so... What is that, 78 years old? Huh. Not too bad. There was a book written about the family and the murder. It's called Blood Relative. It's a book that was written by Crocker Stevenson in 1993. So... That would have been around the time that Jacobs was acquitted, but before he was charged for the kidnapping. Or he might have just been charged for the kidnapping right around the book, when the book came out. Um, you can own this book. It's on Amazon for a mere $293. You can make that yours. So <clears throat> this is the strange case of the Coons family. Thank you for taking this journey with me. Uh, I hope it was interesting for you as is interesting for me. Please like and subscribe. It's free. It is free to just click the like button or subscribe button. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. And it helps me. So happy Thanksgiving to all of you that celebrate here in the States. Otherwise, if you are not in the States or you don't celebrate, have a great Thursday and the rest of your week. I'll see you next Monday for more true crimes with a nasty, nasty, nasty case of murder. Love y'all. Be good to yourself and to others. Let's make this a more peaceful world, can we?